Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, here today to talk about the International Booker Prize long list. I had originally been going to do my, planning to do my uh, wrap up for the month of February today, but I had forgotten that this was going to be happening. So let's take a look at the long listed books. And I, I wanted to particularly do this because I have a goal this year to read outside my comfort zone. And one of the aspects of that is to read more books by authors outside of North America and Europe. And although most of the authors on this list are from Europe, uh, there are some that would potentially qualify. And plus it's just a big major prize. So it's always fun to look at a long list. So let's get started running through some of the titles. I had only really heard of one of these before. So a lot of them are new to me. The first nominee is Red Dog by William Anker. I'm sorry, I'm going to be referring to notes this whole time. It's Red Dog by William Anker, translated by Michael Hines from Afrikaans. In the 18th century, a giant bestrides the border of the Cape Colony frontier. Comrade de Bois, Bois is a legend, a polygamist, a swindler, and a big talker, a rebel who fights with Josha chieftains against the Boers and British, the fierce patriarch of a sprawling mixed-race family with a veritable tribe of followers, a savage enemy, and a loyal ally. Like the wild dogs who are always at his heels, he roams the shifting landscape of southern Africa, hungry and spoiling for a fight. Red Dog is a brilliant, fiercely powerful novel, a wild epic tale of Africa in a time before boundaries between cultures and people were fixed. That actually sounds really interesting to me. I, I would be interested in reading that. And it does fit my goal because um, you know, Africa is definitely outside of North America and Europe. So it hits that, but it just, it sounds interesting to me. So I, I will be looking that one up to find out more about it. Next is The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree by Shukufe Azar. I apologize if I am pronouncing that terribly wrong. It's translated from the Farsi uh, by an anonymous translator. Uh, it comes from Europa Editions and set in Iran in the decade following the 1979 Islamic Re Revolution. This moving, richly imagined novel is narrated by the ghost of Bahar, a 13-year-old girl whose family is compelled to flee their home in Tehran for a new life in a small village, hoping in this way to preserve both their intellectual freedom and their lives. But they soon find themselves caught up in the post-revolutionary chaos that sweeps across the country, a madness that affects both living and dead, old and young. The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree speaks of the power of imagination when confronted with cruelty and of our human need to make sense of the world through the ritual of storytelling. Through her unforgettable characters and glittering magical realist style, Azar weaves a timely and timeless story that juxtaposes the beauty of an ancient, vibrant culture with the brutality of an oppressive political regime. That sounds interesting as well. And uh, since it is translated from Farsi, again, it qualifies for my goal, but uh, just that it sounds interesting. So yeah, that's another one I'll be looking more closely at. Next, we have The Adventures of China Iron by Gabriela Cabezon Camara. Again, I hope I pronounced that correctly. It is translated by Iona McIntyre and Fiona McIntosh from Spanish. The Pampas of Argentina. China is a young woman eking out an existence in a remote gaucho encampment after her no-good husband is conscripted into the army, China bolts for freedom, setting off on a wagon journey through the Pampas in the company of her newfound friend Liz, a settler from Scotland. While Liz provides China with a sentimental education and schools her in the nefarious ways of the British Empire, their eyes are opened to the wonders of Argentina's richly diverse flora and fauna, cultures and languages, as well as to the ruthless violence involved in nation-building. This subversive re retelling of Argentina's foundational gaucho epic, Martin Fierro, is a celebration of the color and movement of the living world, the open road, love and sex, and the dream of lasting freedom. With humor and sophistication, Gabriela Cabezon Camara has created a joyful hallucinatory novel that is also an incisive critique of national origin myths and the casualties of ruthless progress. Well, there's another one that sounds really interesting, and because it is set in Argentina and South America, it also qualifies for my reading goal. So that's an, that's another one. We're three for three. Uh, that's another one I'm going to have to look more closely at. Next, we have the other name, Septology One to Two by John Fossey, translated by Damon Searles from Norwegian. So we have our first book that does not qualify for my reading goal, but let's check it out. This is published by Fitzcarraldo Editions. So there are a lot of names and locations that I don't know how to pronounce in, in this book's plot description. So I'm just going to say that there is a uh, painter and a farm and painter and a farmer fisherman who are living on the coast. There's a doppelganger. Uh, there are two versions of the same person, living two versions of the same life. Written in hypnotic prose that shifts between shifts between the first and third person, the other name calls into question concrete notions around subjectivity and the self. 
what makes us who we are, and why do we lead one life and not another. With the other name, the first volume in a trilogy of novels, Fosse presents us with an indelible and poignant exploration of the human condition that will endure as his masterpiece. Uh, that is the first one, not only is it the first one that doesn't hit my reading goal, it's the first one I don't feel super interested in as well. Uh, it just doesn't really click with me, so... But if you feel differently or if you have read it, you let me know, please, because uh, I'd be interested. Next we have The Eighth Life by Nino Harach Haratischvili. I hope I said that right. <laughs> it is translated by Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin from German. So again, it won't qualify for my reading goal, but uh, the cover looks interesting, so maybe the book will be. This is published by Scribe UK. At the start of the 20th century, on the edge of the Russian Empire, a family prospers. It owes its success to a delicious chocolate recipe, passed down over the generations with great solemnity and caution. A caution which is justified. This is a recipe for ecstasy that carries a very bitter aftertaste. I'm very interested so far. Stasia learns it from her, German, her Georgian father and takes it north, following her new husband Simon to his posting at the center of the Russian Revolution in St. Petersburg. But Stasia's will be the first of a symphony of grand, if all too often doomed, romances that swirl from sweet to sour in this epic tale of the Red Century. Tumbling down the years and across vast expanses of longing and loss, generation after generation of this compelling family hears echoes and sees reflections. Great characters and greater relationships come and go and come again. The world shakes and shakes some more, and the reader rejoices to have found at last one of those glorious old books in which you can live and learn, be lost and found, and make indelible new friends. Yeah, that sounds really interesting to me. Uh, I believe from the announcement that this was a really chunky book. Uh, I, I, I don't know how long. I don't have it in front of me, and this doesn't have a page count, but it definitely stood out among the other books for its length. Um, but that sounds really interesting, and maybe like a proper epic, so that could be good. Now we have Serotonin by Michelle Hulbeck. I hope I said that correctly, I'm sorry. Translated by Sean Whiteside from the French, uh, published by William Heinemann. Dissatisfied and discontented, Florent Claude Lebrust feels he is dying of sadness. His young girlfriend hates him, and his career as an engineer at the Ministry of Agriculture is pretty much over. His only relief comes in the form of a pill, white, oval, small. Recently released for public consumption, Captotrix is a new brand of antidepressant which works by altering the brain's releases of serotonin. Armed with this new drug, Lebrust decides to abandon his life in Paris and return to the Normandy countryside where he used to work promoting regional cheeses and where he had once been in love. But instead of happiness, he finds a rural community devastated by globalization and European agricultural policies and local farmers longing, like Lebrust himself, for an impossible to return to what they remember as the Golden Age. This sounds like a very timely book, especially if you are in Europe. Um, I don't know that it's 100% for me. I haven't gotten along with a lot of the recent artistic projects that kind of hark harken back for a time that was lost. Um, so I just... I'm not sure about that one, but if you have read it, please let me know. I would love your feedback. And now we have Till by Daniel Kelman, translated by Ross Benjamin from German. So this is our second German book, uh, published by Quirkus. He's a trickster, a player, a jester. His hand shakes like a pact with the devil, his smile like a crack of the clouds. He's watching you now, and he's gone when you turn. Till Uhlenspiegel is here. It, in a village like every other village in Germany, a scrawny boy balances on a rope between two trees. He's practicing. He practices by the mill, by the blacksmiths. He practices in the forest at night where the cold woman whispers and goblins roam. When he comes out, he will never be the same. Till will escape the ordinary villages. In the mines, he will defy death. On the battlefield, he will run faster than cannonballs. In the courts, he will trick the heads of state. As a traveling entertainer, his journey will take him across the land and into the heart of a never-ending war. A prince's doomed acceptance of the Bohemian throne has European armies lur lurching brutally for dominion, and now the Winter King casts a sunless pall. Between the quests of fat counts, witch hunters, and scheming queens, Till dances his mocking fugue, exposing the folly of kings and the wisdom of fools. With macabre humor and moving humanity, Daniel Kelman lifts this legend from medieval German folklore and enters him on the stage of the Thirty Years' War. When citizens become the playthings of politics and puppetry, Till, in his demonic grace and thirst for freedom, is the very spirit of rebellion, a cork in water, a laugh in the dark, a hero for all time. Um, 
I had been thinking that this sounded like a story over that originated in folklore, so I'm not surprised to have, have gotten to that part. Um, it sounds interesting. I would probably get to the first three before I would get to this one, but it does sound really interesting. And I think the idea of updating the folklore, but it's still in the past, it sounds really interesting. So I'm going to keep this one on my radar, look a little further into it, and see if that might be something I would want to look into later as well. And now we have Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melkor, translated by Sophie Hughes from Spanish. And this is also from Fitzcarraldo Editions, and our second book in Spanish. Hurricane Season opens with the macabre discovery of a decomposing body in a small waterway on the outskirts of La Matosa, a village in rural Mexico. It soon becomes apparent that the body is that of the local witch, who is both feared by the men and re relied upon by the women, helping them with love charms and illegal abortions. Mirroring the structure of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Chronicle of a Death Foretold, the novel goes back in time, recounting the events which led to Lamatosa's witch murder from Lamatosa's witch's murder from several perspectives. Hurricane Season quickly transcends its detective story constraints. Its culprits are named early on in the narrative, shifting the question to why rather than who. Through the stories of Luis Mi, Norma, Brando, and Munra, Fernando, Mel Fernando Melchor paints a portrait of the lives governed by poverty and violence, machismo and misogyny, superstition and prejudice. Written with a bl brutal lyricism that is as affecting as it is enthralling, Hurricane Season, Melchor's first novel to appear in English, is a formidable portrait of Mexico and its demons. I, I think that does sound interesting, especially the that pull between superstition and prejudice. Um, and yeah, so I'd, I'd be curious to look a little clo more closely into that one as well. And now we get to the one that I was familiar with and which I have been thinking about reading anyway. It's The Mer Memory Police by Yoko Agawa, translated by Steven Snyder from Japanese and published by Harville Secker. Now, um, now, since I said I was already familiar with this and had already been thinking about reading it, you can probably guess <laughs> which way I'm going to go on this, but let's do the plot description anyway. Hat Ribbon Bird Rose. To the people on the island, a disappeared thing no longer has any meaning. It can be burned in the garden, thrown in the river, or handed over to the memory police. Soon enough, the island forgets it ever existed. When a young novelist discovers that her editor is in danger of being taken away by the memory police, she desperately wants to save him. For some reason, he does not forget, and it becomes increasingly difficult for him to hide his memories. Who knows what will vanish next? The Memory Police is a beautiful, haunting, and provocative fable about the power of memory and the trauma of loss from one of Japan's greatest writers. Very interested in this, and I love the... I, it feels like... Unfortunately, it feels timely to be writing a book um, with this kind of anti-authoritarian stance, and I think this is a really interesting way of approaching that subject. So, very interested in this. This is probably the one that I would be the, most likely to pick up in the near future. And now we get to Faces on the Tip of My Tongue by Emmanuel Pagano, translated by Sophie Lewis and Jennifer Higgins from French. Published by Perrine Press, meetings, partings, loves, and losses in rural France are dis dissected with compassion. The late wedding guest isn't your cousin but a drunken chancer. The driver who gives you a lift isn't going anywhere but off the road. Snow settles on your car in summer and the sequins found between the pages of a borrowed novel will make your fortune. Pagano's stories weave together the mad, the mysterious, and the dispossessed of a rural French community with honesty and humor, a superb cumulative collection from a unique French voice. Interesting that this is a short story collection that has made it onto the long list. It'll be interesting to see if it makes it onto the short list. Um, I have to say, maybe it's just that description of it. I don't feel like I was given enough to really entice me. Um, I feel like it would be nice to know a little more about the overall impression of the stories, so I'm not going to dismiss that book outright, but it doesn't grab me as much as some of the other ones that I was interested in. So, now we get to, oh god, I didn't realize it was Samantha Schweblin, so there is there are two, this is, there are two books that I had was had heard of before this. Uh, so, Little Eyes by Samantha Schweblin, translated by Megan McDowell from Spanish, published by One World. Uh, I have read both of Samantha Schweblin's books that have been translated into English, Fever Dream and her story collection, the name of which escapes me at the moment. But I've read both of them. I really liked Fever Dream and I was not, I was very up and down on the stories in the other collection. So let's see what this has in store. They've infiltrated homes in Hong Kong, shops in Vancouver, the streets of Sierra Leone, town squares of Oaxaca, schools in Tel Aviv, and bedrooms in Indiana. They're not pets, nor ghosts, nor robots. They're real people. 
but how can a person living in Berlin walk freely through the living room of someone in Sydney? How can someone in Bangkok have breakfast with your children in Buenos Aires without you knowing, especially when these people are completely anonymous, unknown, untraceable? Intrigued already. The characters in Samantha Shrevelin's wildly imaginative new novel, Little Eyes, reveal the beauty of connection between far-flung souls, but they also expose the ugly truth of our increasingly linked world. Trusting strangers can lead to unexpected love, playful encounters, and marvelous adventures. But what if it can also pave the way for unimaginable terror? Shrevelin has created a dark and complex world that is both familiar but also strangely unsettling, because it's our present and we're living it, we just don't know it yet. I think that concept of something that is familiar and unsettling is when Samantha Shrevelin is at her best. So yes, definitely interested in this. And it has pandas on the cover, so who, how could you not love that? And now we have The Discomfort of Evening by Marika, Marik Lucas Reinfeld. I hope I said that correctly. Translated by Michelle Hutchison from Dutch, published by Faber and Faber. Jas lives with her devout farming family in the rural Netherlands. One winter's day, her older brother joins an ice skating trip. Resentful of being left alone, she makes a perverse plea with God. He never returns. As grief overwhelms the farm, Jas succumbs to a vortex of increasingly disturbing fantasies, watching her family disintegrate into a darkness that threatens to derail them all. A best-selling sensation in the Netherlands by a prize-winning young poet, this debut novel lays everything bare. It is a world of language unlike any other, which Michelle Hutchinson's striking translation captures in all its wild, violent beauty. Sounds interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look further into that one as well. And now we get to our last book, Mac and His Problem by Enrique Villamatas, translated by Margaret Jules Costa and Sophie Hughes from Spanish. Published by Harville Secker. Mac is not writing a novel. He is writing a diary, which no one will ever read. At over 60 and recently unemployed, Mac is a beginner, a novice, and apprentice. Delighted by the themes of repetition and falsification and humbly armed with an encyclopedic knowledge of literature. Mac's wife Carmen thinks he is simply wasting his time and in danger of sliding further into depression and idleness. But Mac persists. Diligently recording his daily walks through the neighborhood, it is the hottest summer Barcelona has seen in over a century. Soon, despite his best intentions not to write a novel, Mac begins to notice that life is exhibiting strange literary overtones and imitating fragments of plot. As he sizzles in the heat wave, he becomes ever more immersed in literature, a literature haunted by death, but alive with the sheer pleasure of writing. Hmm. Hmm. That sounds interesting. I would probably prioritize it beneath some of the other ones uh, that I would be interested in. Again, the one that I would be most interested in would be um, The Memory Police, probably followed by Little Eyes. Uh, Red Dog sounded really interesting to me, as did The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree, and uh, even The Adventures of China Iron. I think I would prioritize those before I would think about that one. Oh, The Eighth Life, I forgot that one. I would put that one ahead of it as well. Um, so there you go. Those are all of the nominees. I have no earthly idea <laughs> which ones are more likely or less likely to make the shortlist, so I'm not going to be making any kind of prediction. I'm simply going to go off of the ones that... I just wanted to go through the list, find the ones that sounded interesting to me, and go with that. Um, so that's how I responded to them. I'd love to hear how you responded, if you have a favorite, if you have one that you're really rooting for, uh, if there are any that you think I should stay away from, drop that comment down below and let me know. And I really look forward to your thoughts on this. Uh, I, I'm really glad we had an, finally have another book award that we can talk about. I know there are some others coming up as well. So yeah, let's talk about this long list. And thank you for your time. As always, it is really appreciated. And I will be back. Until then, happy reading.